Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. You might be wondering why this episode seems so spooky. Well, I made it during October, and if you had been a channel member or a patron, you could have seen it in that month. Oh well. Anyway, I figured that for this month I should take a look at the creepiest creationist there is. Carl Baugh is basically what happens when an eldritch abomination from beyond the stars inhabits the husk of a human body, but never really figures out how humans act or speak. We're taking a look at his show Creation in Symphony, which was apparently published on VHS in 1996. At least that's what IMDB seems to think. Anyway, here's Creation in Symphony. 150 years ago, the theory of evolution found reception in the mind of Western man. You see what I mean? You can tell Carl wrote this because no normal human would say, found reception in the mind of Western man. There's no reason for the passive voice there, the use of reception is non-standard, and it's just all around awkward. It was not a new idea. It had been introduced in religious political documents in ancient Babylon. I would really like to see a citation for an ancient Babylonian religious political document that bears any resemblance to the theory of evolution by natural selection proposed by Darwin, or even better, modern evolutionary theory and later in secular contemplations of developing Greece. Hey, fun fact, the secular sacred distinction didn't really exist until power struggles between the hereditary nobility and the church in Christian-dominated countries. Erasmus Darwin came up with the idea of natural selection as a mechanism for evolution. His grandson Charles introduced the concept to the secular academic community, which was eager to embrace a non-theistic doctrine yeah, that's why leading scientists at the time, like Charles Lyell and Richard Owen, were lifelong Christian believers who rejected the idea, although Lyell softened to it eventually, and who accepted special creation and the flood of Noah. This doctrine removed the need for a creator in the natural world and the need for accountability in the spiritual world. Weird how the majority of Christians seem to accept the theory of evolution while still seeing a creator and the need for their salvation as, you know, still a thing. It's almost like Ba is just making shit up. The text of this video series shows that evolution does not work in theory or in laboratory research. The evidence is heavily in favor of special creation. Yeah. Is it though? In this series of lectures, a complete creation model has been developed with extensive technical references. I feel like they just don't plan to give us these references, or if they do, that they won't actually support special creation. Prepare to have your mind dramatically expanded and your faith academically justified as our speaker, Dr. Carl Ball, takes you on a fascinating journey from the microscopic to the galactic. Discover creation in symphony. Hello, I'm Carl Ball, director of Creation Evidences Museum in Glen Rose and director of International Expeditions looking for living dinosaurs. You know, the weird thing is that now, nearly 30 years since this video was made, and despite how easy it is to find living dinosaurs who live on every continent, yes, even Antarctica, and virtually every island, he hasn't found a one. Maybe he shouldn't lead with that. Welcome to the discussion today. We're going to discuss very intimate questions which have to do with your past, your present, and your future. Carl Baugh asking me intimate questions sounds like the most awkward horror show imaginable. And that of all of mankind. We're going to talk about dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus rex, Pachycephalosaurus, Acrocanthosaurus. Pro tip to the editor and or cameraman, you might want to pan or truck the camera to the animals he's mentioning since his gestures imply that there are models of them around the set. Are there any dinosaurs still alive today? Yeah, there are penguins, eagles, ostriches, flamingos, cormorants, robins, parrots, etc. Recently our team arrived from an international expedition in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. We have over a dozen eyewitness accounts of creatures that for the world sound like in the description of those personal eyewitness accountants that's not what the word accountant means. Including pastors, educators, uh, school teachers, heads of clans, chieftains, 
Ah yes, all people with impeccable skills of observation and extensive training in comparative anatomy and taxonomy. Uh, these creatures, according to those descriptions, for the world sound like remphorinkoid pterodactyls. So Carl's evidence of living dinosaurs is that some chieftains and missionaries say they saw things that aren't dinosaurs. And of course his expedition didn't turn up any physical evidence, so even the reported non-dinosaurs almost certainly don't exist. With leather-like wings, reptiles, with a beak, a crest, hands on their wings, uh, webbed feet. These creatures glow in the dark from their undersection. Which would make them the only known bioluminescent tetrapods, you know, if they existed. Often the tail glows in the dark. For you scholars in the audience, you'll recognize that a pterodactyl that has a tail would be a rampharynchoid pterodactyl. Wrong. Here's a pterodactyloid pterosaur, Pteranodon longiceps. You might notice that it has a tail supporting the posterior most wing membrane. Rampharynchoid pterosaurs are known for their long tails, but later pterosaurs were not tailless. Now, according to the theory of evolution, which in the past I have believed and taught, but do no longer believe nor teach, Bull Carl evinces no evidence that he understands even the most basic aspects of evolution, and so couldn't possibly have taught in any legitimate way. According to the theory of evolution, Rampharynchoid pterodactyls saw their demise 225 million years ago. That's the early Norian stage of the Triassic. The prototypical Rampharynchoid, Rampharynchus, is from the Tithonian and Kimmerigian stages of the Jurassic, the final two stages of the Jurassic, some 157.3 to 145 million years ago. So, you know, about 100 million years later than Pa is allowing for. And it's not evolution that says that, it's stratigraphy and radiometric dating that say that, both of which are independent of evolution. The fact that they tend to line up with evolutionary biology is just more evidence that evolutionary biology provides a useful and likely accurate model of the past history of life on Earth. Are they still around? Well, let's explore the issue. I love this because one, he knows his expedition turned up absolutely nothing, and two, even if there were some ghost lineage of rampharynchoid pterosaurs that had survived to the 1990s, that wouldn't mean anything for evolution. Ghost lineages are a thing, since the fossil record is far from complete. I'm glad you're here. That had all the welcoming charm of a vampire welcoming you to his castle. By the way, how did you get here? I've had multiple requests to cover Carl, and I figured that given how absurdly inhuman and creepy he is, that October would be a good time to do it. So when I went looking towards the end of September for the creepiest and stupidest content I could find to respond to, Carl popped up really fast as a good idea. And that's how I got to be here, responding to a man who acts exactly how you might expect someone named Hugh Mann of Humansville, Missouri to act. Well, I don't mean um, your mode of transportation, the vehicle in which you arrived. I mean, how did you get here? YouTube. You as a person, living, breathing thinking. Carl knows what sex is, right? Like, he can't be so divorced from humanity that he doesn't know what sex is. Reasoning, feeling, deciding, sensing all that's about you. How did you get here? It's still sex. My parents had sex. I was conceived. My egg was laid. I hatched. That question is central to what makes us tick and all our future. You know, I for one don't think that my future is primarily determined by what my parents got up to the day I was conceived. In fact, I don't really think about it much. It's kind of weird that apparently Carl thinks about his parents doing the nasty and the pasty all the time. It's central to our reasoning processes. The great philosophers of the centuries have asked that question along with three others. Every grandmother in this audience, every child, every granddad, every parent, Every individual that has Mario walked down to Shelbyville, I needed a new heel for my shoe. So I decided to go to Morganville, which is what they call Shelbyville in those days. So I tied an onion to my belt, which was the style. These are the great questions of life. Number one, who am I? I'm the dapper dinosaur. I said that already. Number two. How did I get here? That's the question I asked a moment ago. What brought me here? 
searching YouTube for the stupidest thing a creepy old guy who seems as human as Edgar from Men in Black right before he sheds his human suit has ever produced. What are the life processes? What are the life processes? What a weird and vague question. I don't know. Metabolism? Intake of nutrients? Waste removal and reproduction? There, I'll go with that. Did I arrive by naturalistic circumstances with a fortunate combination of time, chance, and inanimate matter? I mean, those things were definitely involved, although without perfect knowledge I can't really say for certain that that's all that was involved, and if you want to think that there was more involved without denying science, then go for it. I'm not here to advocate for or against such beliefs. Did the universe produce me in an evolutionary, naturalistic means? Me, personally? No, because evolution is a thing that happens to populations, not individuals. Was my species Ceratosaurus nasicornis so produced? Yes. Or was I supernaturally created in the original proto-form? Nope, I'm pretty sure my embryonic development wasn't a miracle. Neither was Carl's, I'm willing to bet. I'm sure when he was decanted from his maturation tube, the inhuman cloners didn't use any magic in creating him. Just inscrutable alien motivation. Number three. What am I doing here? Eking out a living by responding to pseudoscientific conspiracy theories like Young Earth Creationism, New Age, Ancient High Tech Nonsense, etc. What's my purpose here? Same question, same answer. Number four, where am I going? The liquor store, probably, because I need to soothe my brain. All of these issues are germane to the issues of life. All people ask these questions. They might, may not phrase them in that particular phraseology, but all individuals worldwide have always asked these questions, and we're going to explore these questions and hopefully arrive at some plausible academic answers. How does any of this connect to glow-in-the-dark pterosaurs? Like, he started with that, left it to go talk about random questions, and now what? I want more sparkly Mesozoic flying reptiles, darn it. This program examines life origins, comparison of life origins. So wait, now we're off to abiogenesis? This is just a stream of consciousness, isn't it? No wonder I tend not to cover Ba much. We've been taught in this modern generation, and I have explored educational paths down dusty trails and distant lands and down jungle trails and sandy beaches. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. Get on with it. Get on with it. I've lectured in some of the major universities and some of the colleges of the world. I've lectured to private audiences. In other words, he was invited by students and it was in no way an official school function or endorsed by the staff in any way. Got it. And I've been concerned about these questions. Life origins, comparison of life origins. There was a time when I personally thought humanistic and atheistic thoughts. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? Oh no, quelle horreur! But also, I don't buy it. There was a time when I believed and taught evolution. Well, that's just a lie, because to teach something, you have to first understand it. If I say I once taught Japanese, and I'm incapable of actually producing a single original sentence in Japanese, then you can be well assured that I never taught it. Similarly, Carl can't for the life of him accurately present evolutionary biology, so he never taught it. At best, he might have taught his straw man version of it to creationist audiences. And here's the thing, I can't find any mention of any teaching credentials or degrees at all for Carl nor any record of him having taught in any capacity except as the founder of the Creation Evidence Museum. Even his own bio at his own museum doesn't indicate any degrees or teaching experience beyond speaking engagements as the director of the museum. When even your own bio in your own website won't list your credentials or teaching experience, it's pretty safe to say you don't have any. What changed my own thinking? I've yet to see any evidence that Carl's thinking has changed. The earliest time he seems to appear in the public spotlight is when he founded the Creation Evidence Museum in two double-wide trailers in Glen Rose, Texas, near the Paluxy River. I do think he is simply making up a false biography for himself because it sounds impressive if he was some big-shot atheist teacher of evolution who found out that the evidence points away from evolution and then had his come-to-Christ moment. It's basically the same energy as the North Korean press reporting that the dictator de jure 
always gets a hole in one on every hole every time he plays golf, and it was born on the top of a holy mountain as doves descended from the heavens. It's all just propaganda. Is it possible for evolution to have occurred? Well, since it currently is observably occurring, both in laboratory settings and in the wild, I see no reason to think it didn't occur in the past. In fact, to say that it didn't, one would need to propose some mechanism which would prevent it. Two of the world's great scholars, astrophysicist Sir Frederick Hoyle, Ph.D. Not an evolutionary biologist, and the man who was laughed out of respectability when he pretended that Archaeopteryx's feathers were actually just chicken feathers pressed into concrete that had been applied to the slab. Never mind that the counter slab corresponded to the slab perfectly, meaning that this is impossible, and of course the fact that the feathers are pressed into the same limestone that makes up the rest of the rock. Yeah, great pick for a spokesperson, someone who was basically a fraud, or at least fraud adjacent when it came to paleontology. And Chandra Wickramasinghe, PhD. Oh, another astronomer, and the co-author of the absurd Archaeopteryx is a fake paper. Yeah, another shining light in evolutionary biology. He was also an author on that absurd 2018 paper proposing that cephalopods are aliens despite being morphologically and genetically fully nested within mollusca. That was also not taken seriously by anyone who knew the first thing about cephalopods specifically, or mollusks more broadly. Explored the issues recently with unlimited funding. There's only so much money in the world at any given time. That's literally impossible. Carl could at least make his lies somewhat plausible, but no. Unlimited access to the libraries and laboratories of the world. No, in fact. As an example, after the absurd Archaeopteryx paper, they were denied further access to the specimen for destructive testing because of how badly they'd botched it the first time. Also, most libraries are open to the public anyway, although somehow I doubt either was allowed into, say, the Vatican archives, which are not open to the public, but which you can get access to if you actually have research that works in there would help with. It's not actually a secret vault full of material never meant to see the light of day, despite what Dan Brown might have you believe. And uh, they wanted to know the answer to the question, is it possible for life to have originated somewhere in the universe or on planet Earth by naturalistic means? Okay, everybody. Y'all ready for big number, therefore God? It's coming. And I know because these guys are the source for the tornado in a junkyard nonsense. And of course, all of this work they did was before most of the current knowledge of the origin of life's chemistry was established. So they were basing it on more or less nothing. And assuming that chemistry is just random atoms bumping into each other completely randomly, which it most certainly is not. That's illustrated in the Big Bang Theory. Nope, the Big Bang and the origin of life are separate things. If life had to have a supernatural origin, that doesn't negate the Big Bang. And if the Big Bang isn't real, that has nothing to do with how the first life arose. Of course, Hoyle is the one who coined the phrase Big Bang as a pejorative because he didn't like it, and he thought it sounded too much like Genesis. Because remember, he was an atheist who wanted the universe to be eternal, because if it had a beginning, that begged the question of what started it, and it seemed a bit too convenient that God was right there with his followers, alleging that he'd always said it was him that started it. That's why the Catholic priest who first proposed the Big Bang was so happy. The steady state universe was preferred by most atheists and rejected by most theists in favor of a definite timeline of creation. You'd think modern theists would take this as a win, but I guess not, or at least the ones like Carl don't. Timeline of the universe, the naturalistic concept. And we have paraphrased that academically to show a moment of infinite temperature and inflation, an era of inflation. We've paraphrased that academically. What in the world does that mean? Carl is just stringing words together. I think when English was uploaded to his ganglia, the transfer didn't go well, and since no one around was a native English speaker, or even human, no one noticed. So he was just sent to Texas with a broken understanding of the English lexicon, but with most of it still rattling around in there anyway. So now he just speaks random words occasionally when his human impersonation algorithms return faulty instructions based on the botched English upload. The documentation early, according to the postulate of humanist and astrophysicist who work in cosmology, of gravity, a strong force, electromagnetic force, and a weak force. I have absolutely no idea what he's talking about, especially with the humanism thing. Toss that word salad well, Carl. If anyone wants to have a day of torture, try diagramming the sentence of Boz. And then a time when the universe became transparent very early 
in the evolution of the universe according to standard evolutionary model. So here, I think he's talking about when light and matter became decoupled, which is a part of the Big Bang model, but which has nothing to do with the theory of evolution or any models therein. Because get this, the theory of evolution and cosmological models have essentially nothing to do with each other. And then a time when galaxies and quasars began to appear. Quasars are active galactic nuclei. Saying that galaxies and quasars appeared is like saying that humans and human toes appeared. One kind of implies the other. And the current chaotic universe becoming self-realizing in the mind of man. Did he just say that the Big Bang says that humans imagined the universe into existence and did so starting with the formation of the first galaxies? I can assure you that the theory says no such thing and that humans were not around to bring the universe into being some 14 to 13 billion years ago when the first galaxies were forming. You see what I mean when I say that Carl Baugh would fail the Turing test versus most AI chatbots? If you had a text conversation with Baugh and ChatGPT and were asked which one was the real human, I guarantee you'd pick ChatGPT over Carl here. That's assuming the chatbot doesn't just directly out itself as a large language model, which it tends to do. What are the possibilities that this could occur? That the universe could have reached its current state of relatively low temperature, low density, and high entropy after an initial hot, dense, and low entropy state? Basically 100%. That's where all the evidence points, even if the current crisis in cosmology means that the timescale for that is more up in the air than we'd like. After spending more than a decade examining the issues and having at their disposal unlimited funding, which again is not a thing that happened because it's literally logically impossible. In no possible world can you have unlimited funding for research. You can have more than you'd ever need, but not unlimited. Once a commodity becomes so ubiquitous, it's no longer scarce, it can't be money, and that would happen before it becomes infinite. There's a reason no one pays for groceries in oxygen. There's so much of it that everyone already has all they can reasonably use for basically any purpose. And yet there's far from an infinite amount of oxygen on Earth. Did Carl not get the economic subroutine when his database was being uploaded? Unlimited access to the great libraries and laboratories of the world. You think the way Baugh talks about them, that Hoyle and Wickramasing were gods or something, or at least the emperors of Earth. As it turns out, they were not. Sir Frederick Hoyle and Chandra Wickrama Singh came to a conclusion. They stated that life originating in this universe or on planet Earth by naturalistic circumstances has one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. Let me say that again. No, I'm not going to let him say it again, but yeah, there it is. Big number, therefore God. Of course, literally no one in the fields of origin of life, or just biology broadly, took this number seriously because it's based on literally nothing. And then these two great scholars said, let's illustrate how impossible that is. They said it would be easier for a whirlwind to sweep through a junkyard and assemble a Boeing 747 jet in flight out the other end than it would be for life to have originated on planet Earth or in the universe by natural evolutionary means. Wake me up when commercial jet planes start reproducing with variability that affects how successful they are at reproduction. Till then, it's a dumb analogy, and with Ramasing, Hoyle and virtually every creationist you've ever heard of is dumb for using it. Or is perhaps just a lying piece of sh Or hey, maybe both. Let me illustrate how large that number really is. Nah, we get it. It's more than the number of electrons in the universe. This is the most basic bitch creationism stuff and I'm not going to waste my time or the audience's time on some long drawn out explanation that big number is big. We all get it. The made-up number that was made to be as big as possible, and isn't actually meaningful, is really big. No one cares. Also, he says that electrons are the smallest particle, which is dumb because electrons don't have a volume near as we can tell, which is also true for all fundamental particles. And if he means just the least massive particle, then I'll point out that neutrinos exist, and have way less mass than an electron. So Carl is just dumb all around. Now these were not 
creationists and Christians and theologians analyzing the data. Yeah, in fact, the reason they didn't like the Big Bang was that it was too Christian-friendly. Odd source to cite. But of course, they also were not chemists or biologists, and their data was just playing games with numbers until they got a big one that confirmed their biases, which is why their work in this area is actually ignored by basically everyone who has a bachelor's or better in any relevant field. This was Sir Frederick Hoyle and Chandra Wickramasinghe, recognized internationally as great scholars. I mean, when it comes to nucleosynthesis, sure, but otherwise they're remembered as contrarian nutters who mostly authored nonsense that no one cared about, and who threatened to damage fossils because they thought that limestone and cement are just the same thing. I have at my disposal the complete works of Charles Darwin. Okay, they're public domain. That's not special. Also, who cares? They're not exactly on the cutting edge of research. They're from like a century and a half ago. We've moved on. No one is basing their new research on the descent of man or the origin of species. He's the hero of the evolutionary plot. Um, no. There's no hero and there's no plot. Just like Lord Kelvin isn't the hero of thermodynamics, he's just the guy who figured out the basics of it. Darwin isn't the hero of evolution. He's just the guy who first published some plausible mechanisms for it. Science isn't a revealed religion like Christianity that relies on the testimony of prophets. Darwin, like Kelvin, is of historical interest at this point. No one in physics or biology is doing their research because they're under the guidance of either person. They're looking at data that come to them and using theoretical frameworks that may have been founded by those two, but have since greatly expanded beyond them and contain no necessary reference to them. I have the complete works of his bulldog, Huxley. Somehow even more meaningless. I have some other works here representing atheistic thinking. What does that even mean? Does Carl keep a fancy edition of the God Delusion on his set bookshelf or something? And these are all at the disposal of our committee. What the f*** is this? Carl lets his buddies read his books. Okay. He's acting like this is ancient Rome when a book had to be hand copied laboriously by scribes and having a copy of a work was a mark of prestige, so much so that the wealthy would barter various titles from each other. Anyone can go out and buy a copy of Darwin or Huxley's books, or request one from their local library, even if it takes an interlibrary loan. And while I don't know about 1996 when this came out, here in the year of our Lord, 2023, or 4 depending on whether you're watching this on Early Access or not, they're all just freely available online. Yet further, these books are irrelevant to any current discussion of evolution, because they're all over a century out of date. How does Carl think bragging about his book collection of easily acquired books that are irrelevant anyway helps his case at all? It's just more evidence that he's not actually a human, but an alien programmable biological entity sent here to disrupt the advancement of Homo sapiens on behalf of extra-dimensional intelligences. By the way, at the Creation Evidences Museum, we have over 50 scholars, consultants, who travel from major universities or their own laboratories and uh, spend time in research with us. We're doing research that one of uh, NASA's engineers who helped design the most uh, successful experiment in space that NASA has biologically performed stated to the press that the research we're doing at the Creation Evidences Museum in low profile temporary facilities so Richard Summers was indeed a NASA engineer, but I can't find a single shred of evidence of his involvement in the Creation Evidence Museum beyond what Carl calls reference number six, which cites Pueblo, Colorado Press. Does that mean the Pueblo Chieftain, KOAA News 5, Fox 21 News, the Pueblo Star Journal, KFEL, the religious radio station? You might be surprised to find out that there are many press outlets surfacing Pueblo, Colorado, and saying some guy once said a thing to one of them isn't a citation. If you don't know where you got some piece of information, you can't give a reference for it. Just admit you don't know where you heard it. Also, you'd think that if Summers was working with Ba, he himself could have simply been asked where he said that, and he might have been able to help. Or he could have made his own statement to Ba. Everything about this makes me think that Summers is in no way affiliated with Ba, and given that I can't find anything linking him to creationism, I suspect Ba simply made up the affiliation. No, I don't know this for certain. Maybe Ba is just really bad at his job, and Summers, despite his mathematical acumen, 
is in fact a crazy person. Is more important than all the work he had ever done, even for NASA. And I think before the program is over, if you'll stay with me, uh, you'll understand why this is so important. We're trying to solve the basic issues of life. But he's not, though. He's trying to fit evidence to his dogmatically derived prior conclusion that Genesis is a mostly literal account of actual past events. He thinks he knows the answers, and he's just trying to make them seem as possible as he can. This is a prime example of motivated reasoning and why it tends to lead you astray. Life Origins Is creation plausible? If you mean some kind of general creation where the ultimate cause of reality is a transcendent being, then I don't know. I don't know how to assess that for plausibility, nor do I have an interest in the question as far as this channel is concerned. If you mean special creation as described in Genesis when read literally, no, it's not. Is evolution plausible? Yes, in the same way that the internet is plausible. It's a thing that you can see right now. Calling it implausible is to deny reality. But then, Ba is a young earth creationist, so denying reality is sort of his thing. Charles Darwin is the hero of the plot no, he's not, and we're not going to go over his biography again. I'm skipping until we're done with Chucky e. D. Just know that Baugh goes off and lies about Darwin and ends by saying chaos is central to the evolutionary concept. Whatever that is. We have a chart designed by our research, encompassing more than 35 years. I love that it took more than 35 years, older than some of my audience, to come up with a chart that's basically a mild straw man of most of the science Ba doesn't like. And published scholastically by the Creation Evidences Museum, illustrating the theory of evolution. It begins with a Big Bang or a steady state thesis, either apply. Nope, evolution starts first with living things, since it's a theory of biodiversity. And the thing is that the fact that Carl knows that steady state or Big Bang both allow evolution means he knows he's lying when he says that some particular theory of cosmogony is part of the theory of evolution. If the Big Bang were part of evolution, then an evolution wouldn't be open to a steady state eternal universe, and such a universe, if it were to exist, would falsify evolution. Yet I know, you know, and he knows it would not. Meaning that this is not part of the theory of evolution. Carl is admitting in so many words, just what I said, that this is a chart of science he doesn't like. In this naturalistic state, it continues through the nebular hypothesis, which essentially means that debris from the Big Bang coalesced in the area of the solar system about 4.6 billion years ago, according to the evolutionary theory. Uh, no. <laughs> the nebula from which the solar system formed is not supposed to have been directly from the Big Bang. That would have been essentially all hydrogen and absolutely nothing heavier than lithium. But look around. You are currently watching this on something made of things like carbon, silicon, copper, tin, silver, bismuth, indium, zinc, titanium, oxygen, and even gold. Those didn't pop out of the Big Bang and required things like supernovas to form. The nebula that the solar system formed from was the debris of some 10 billion years or so of stars forming, burning through their fuel, and exploding, seeding interstellar space with heavy elements. Now, granted, hydrogen remained by far the most common element, but the very existence of heavier atoms precludes debris from the Big Bang being a reasonable explanation for the origin of the protocellular nebula. Now, I've stated something quite important there. You see, according to the theory of evolution, life processes on planet Earth are the product of debris from a Big Bang. Nope, the theory of evolution is agnostic and apathetic towards the origin of life. Think about it like a recipe for bread. The recipe doesn't care where the wheat used to make your flour comes from, or what cow was milked to make the butter, or what the lineage is of the Saccharomyces cerevisiae that you put in there to help it rise. If you've got the ingredients for bread, or for evolution, you'll get bread, or evolution. No matter how or from where, you got the ingredients. By the way, evolution still works even if life had to be or was created miraculously by a god. What that really means is subliminally, if we accept the naturalistic postulate of evolution. Evolution neither precludes the supernatural nor is it a postulate, which is a proposition that seems undeniably true and is accepted as such for the purpose of further reasoning. Some actual postulates in science include that the universe works in regular ways, 
that these regular workings are the same across time and space, and that repeated observations predict future similar observations. Because most God concepts would mean that God could violate any of these if he wants, science generally discounts God not because he can't exist, or because the scientists don't believe in God, although many do not, but because not doing so makes science impossible. We're really the product of debris. We started as a piece of trash. Way to use loaded language. The word trash is in reference to the stated purpose of some agency, and the thing referred to as such has no further use for any purpose. For example, if you have some old newspaper and toss it out, it's trash. But if you instead use it to protect your garage floor from spray paint when you spray paint some cosplay prop or a model you're going to paint, suddenly the same thing isn't trash. If there's no god, then until intelligent agents arise, nothing can be trash. Things would simply exist. If God does exist and he started the universe with the Big Bang with a goal of getting intelligent agents, then nothing that acted to get creatures like us into existence is trash. From an explosion. The Big Bang was not an explosion of matter or energy within space-time. It was an expansion of space-time itself. These are distinct concepts with only the expansion part having anything in common between the two. And these life processes continued in progression. Life processes before life, huh? Sure, that makes sense. Now, subliminally, that's important in the theory of evolution, that we began as debris, and then life organized itself. We'll talk about that a bit later. Since so far none of this actually has anything to do with the theory of evolution, I don't think it's important to it. But also, these things are subliminally important? No, there's nothing subliminal going on here. Evolution isn't here to convince you of some moral or philosophical idea about things like the meaning or worth of life. Finally, man arrived on the scene some 4.6 billion years after the coalition of debris. Skipping from abiogenesis to humans, huh? So skipping basically all of evolution, the thing we're supposed to be talking about. Neat. From that explosion, but that's not the end of the story. According to the theory of evolution, these masses of stars this solar system will continue to expand out and out and out until it dies a heat death. Or, if there's enough mass in the universe to cause the universe to collapse back upon itself, then we'll die with a fiery explosion. Either way, there's no hope. Carl's going to die long before either of those scenarios, no matter what, God or not. Now, this was published in 1996, when the Big Crunch was still a viable option for the ultimate fate of the universe. Since then, we've found that it's pretty well precluded, but I won't fault Carl for not being able to see the future. But that the universe left to its own devices will eventually reach thermodynamic equilibrium, aka heat death, doesn't mean there's no God. It doesn't mean you can't have hope either in God or the future. That's a thing for you to worry about. The science isn't concerned about hope. You're a creature whose lifespan is measured in decades, not billions or trillions of years. I can pretty much guarantee you that nothing you've ever done in your whole life has been for the benefit of those who will be here even a thousand years in the future. Never mind in a quadrillion years. You should have hopes for your children, grandchildren, the future of your society in the next few decades or even centuries. If you want eternal hope, go find a religion if you like. Nothing about evolution precludes God. Hopelessness is written into the very warp and woof of the concept of evolution. Ooh, nice use of warp and woof. But no, scientific theories aren't about hope or hopelessness. The germ theory of disease, the heliocentric model of the solar system, the theory of general relativity, and the theory of universal gravitation are all just theories just like evolution. And none of them are there to provide you with hope or not. They are simply models that explain reality and predict future observations. None of them incorporate a god in their explanatory mechanism, nor confirm some kind of afterlife. British philosopher Bertrand Russell. Carl Bosch sure does like talking about people who are not currently evolutionary biologists. You know, the kind of people who might be relevant to this. But okay, what did Mr. Russell have to say that Carl can twist to make evolution seem bad? Spent a lifetime analyzing the chaos and the hopelessness of evolutionary naturalism. And he finally said, we must settle for unyielding despair. He said, all the high noon of genius, 
all the hopes of man, all the work of individual lives, will ultimately collapse in a fiery explosion, the death of the solar system. And all that's left is unyielding despair. Cool. I don't care. At best, this is just an argument from consequences. Don't believe in science because it will lead you to a bleak outlook. Hey, guess what? That doesn't mean it's not true. There are lots of things that are true that I wish were not, and that are not true that I wish were. That doesn't mean anything for the truth value of those propositions. I wish I had a million dollars in my savings account. I don't. I wish malaria was extinct. It's not. Well, I'd like to settle for a lot more than that, and I'd like to give you some hope. I mean, go for it. There are plenty of people with hope more or less the same as Boz who do not reject science. Of course, if this turns into preaching, we'll cut it off. I assume everyone in my audience is aware of the basics of Christianity and that nothing Carl can preach at them will be particularly informative, especially since I suspect that Carl is no more theologically sophisticated than he is scientifically sophisticated. Will evolution work? What does that even mean? If you wanted to play a Carl drinking game, just take a drink every time Carl says something that is literally nonsense, as in there's no thought conveyed in his utterance because the words as he has arranged them together don't actually mean anything. According to these two great scholars, Sir Frederick Coyle and Chandra Wickramasinghe, it won't work. Yeah, two guys who didn't know what they were talking about because they were far outside their fields didn't like evolution. You know what that means for the truth of evolution? Absolutely nothing. Let's take it further. Further than what? I guess that's another nonsense statement. The current modern theorist who has the attention of the entire world is Stephen Jay Gould of Harvard. I mean, maybe in 1996 he had the attention of the world, but punctuated equilibrium, as he and Eldridge proposed, has basically been rejected today, but okay. In Natural History, he wrote not long ago, I regard the failure to find a clear vector of progress in life's history as the most puzzling fact of the fossil record. Okay, that's cool. I don't know what that's supposed to mean for me or evolutionary biology, but sure. Another scholar, Professor L.B. Halsted, an atheist, wrote in Nature, Oh, another question that probably won't mean anything for evolution being true or not. Look, this is getting exhausting. Let's pick up next time with the quotation from L.B. Halsted. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and tell me in the comments. If you didn't, feel free to hit dislike and tell me what the problem was in the comments. Either way, please remember to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're always notified when I have more content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Hey, before you leave, I just want to take a second to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Tovind, Whispers, Denny5252, Elrond Teller, Philip Rivara, Ian Chen, Kelvin Brostick Van Manen, Landon Knoll, Mabdi Babdi, Monkey They Them, Sphincter of Doom, Strawberry Vein, Star Runner, and Dr. Tapioca Weasel. It's because of my channel members and patrons whom you're seeing on screen that this channel can stay afloat. Without you, it would all shut down. If you want to join the team, there's a link to join the channel below this video, and there's a link to join the Patreon in the description. On the Patreon, you can get a 10% discount for pledging annually, and either way, you get early access to virtually all of my scripted videos, often three to five months before they come out for the general public. Thanks for watching.